a pair of jeans that fit the way that we like and even though it's all stained up and it's not even blue anymore they're white because they've been washed so many times right that pair of jeans if you go to patch it with a new piece of denim it's not going to mesh you say well it's made of the same stuff well yeah it's made of denim but the new garment and the old don't agree uh, in fact he goes on to say in verse number 36 if otherwise then both the new maketh a rent now that rent okay, Old Testament they would say that somebody arose and rent their clothes it means that they would literally tear their clothes as a sign of humility right? sometimes heartbrokenness before God there's also a sign of repentance well you say well that was them tearing how can something new that's been put on something old to fix it how can that cause a rent well that word rent means literally to divide or to separate when you put something new onto something old and it doesn't go together it causes a separation in fact if it doesn't mesh very well that's all that anybody's going to see okay well he goes on to say also he says and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old in order to add the new fabric to the old you had to destroy something that was new and was whole in order to put it on something that was old and needed patching up but he says the new agreeeth not with the old if you take something just give you an example okay when it comes to cars you can change the coilovers on your suspension but if the problem is with the hydraulics or the pneumatics right just changing the spring isn't going to help too much if anything the other three tires aren't going to have as much spring as the other one did right car's going to ride funky doesn't agree with it okay if we were to come in today and we just took out three pews in one section and it just didn't address it right it wouldn't agree okay now if there was a reason for it like if i tripped and fell on one of them and split it in half that'd be a pretty good reason not to have it there but there'd be chairs in you know its place but still it agreeeth not doesn't matter it's made of the same fabric doesn't matter that they could be the same color you know the difference between worn and not worn okay the world knows the difference between new and not new and certainly the difference between new and well used and when you try to make the two become one it just don't work if you were to patch a pair of blue jeans that had a new patch that's not going to stretch the same way that the other fabric does it's not going to wear the same way it's not going to function the same way you took two and you tried to make it one and it hurts both of them more instead of having a new piece of fabric and instead of having an old pair of jeans that you patch up to wear in a suitable manner instead of having two now you got none because you had to destroy this in order to make the patchwork and then now that you patch this up you can't stand to look at it because it doesn't go together that well, one goes on to say verse number 37 and no man put a new wine into old bottles else new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled and the bottles shall perish but new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved now new wine we know we, nowadays we would call that grape juice and it probably didn't taste like Welch's because Welch's got a whole bunch of stuff in it to make it not go bad while it's on the you know store shelf and then in your fridge for like four months that's not natural so Right, I don't know what their grape juice I just know what the grape juice we got tastes like but I do know that grape juice is fairly acidic a lot of fruits their juice acidic lemons oranges right grapes is one of them okay now it's not coca-cola right but it is acidic if you put grape juice into what they had called a wine skin that's where they'd take a piece of leather they would craft it not into a bottle like y'all's yetis and the big thermoses that y'all carry around with you all the time not a bottle like that okay it was sewn together around the edges and it was literally a leather sack 
Now, there were ways that you could cure it in order to make it rigid on the outside of it so it just wasn't a piece of leather flapping around. But when he says bottles, he's not talking about what we think about when we think of bottles. It's made out of leather. And here, back in that day, everybody knew. You got new grape juice, you want to put it into a wine skin, you got to make a new one for it. Can't reuse an old one. Because the old one, it had been paired with the wine that went into it when it was new. New wine, as we already said, it's acidic. As that wine stays in that wine skin. Okay, I've never studied out the process of how long it takes from when you squeeze it until it starts to ferment, but I know it don't happen immediately. And in that process, the grape juice eats away at the leather, and the leather sucks up some of the stuff in the grape juice. So much so that if you put new wine into the old leather, because the old leather already had some of the stuff taken out and eaten away at it by the acidity of the grape juice, the new wine, if you put it into the old one, it's thinner. It's already become dried out because the wine that was in it, it's gone. When leather gets dry, what happens? It becomes brittle. begins to crack. As long as there's grape juice in it, it's not going to dry out. But the second that it's out and you try to put more in after it's dried out, literally the grape juice will eat a hole through it. It may take a day, may take a week may take a while, but eventually that new wine, that grape juice, is going to eat right through the old bottle. And literally, if you went through all the effort, they didn't go down to Kroger and grab the grape juice. Right? They had to go inspect the vines in the vineyard. They had to throw out the bad grapes. Then they had to squish the good grapes. And they had to squish it in such a manner that you know you couldn't just take it and go, all right, a little bit of grape juice. No, they were processing lots of it. Okay, hopefully they didn't do it by feet like you see in all the cartoons and the movies and the TV shows. I don't want feet juice. Okay? But they would smash it most of the time in what's called a wine press. And they'd have to do it in such a way that the wine wouldn't be wasted, wouldn't be spilled out on the floor, but they could collect it. And everything they did so meticulously, the hours and the days and the weeks out in the hot sun nurturing and pruning away at that vine all of it gone in an instant if you put it in the wrong bottle can't drink it anymore because it's been spilled out on the ground well you can but if you want muddy grape juice be my guest you can have all the one I don't want none of it so he says new wine requires new bottles Okay, the challenge he's making, to, if you went through all that effort out in the vineyard, right, why wouldn't you go get new leather to put the new product into? If you didn't own the vineyard and you went to go buy it, why would you buy the stuff in the old bag? Why wouldn't you want the stuff in the new bag? Right, well, that one was cheaper. Yeah, but you know, that one's going to last. Right, well, that one was marked down half price because he knows you're not getting out the store with, you know, without the bag bursting on you. Well, he said that this one tasted better. Well, maybe if you can drink it. Right, but I'd take the sure thing, not the iffy thing. Okay, nowadays, it'd be the same thing as saying, you know, you see a police car and you decide to go 100 mile an hour past him and then you're surprised when you get the speeding ticket. Duh. I'm upset if that guy doesn't pull you over. Okay, I'll do. I, I don't know. I blame them. It's their generation, right? It's not my generation. It's their generation. But we got a bunch of idiots out there that thinks they can just do whatever they want with no consequences. Duh. Well, the same thing's true when it comes to your Christianity. New wine requires new bottles. All the effort you go through to labor in the Lord today, you got to you know, craft something to put it in. Yesterday's bottle is not going to work for today. You need today's bottle. And tomorrow, you're going to need a new bottle. Uh, well, he goes on to say verse number 9. No man having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith the old is better. And Brother Bob, this is one of them verses that Every now and then I think about 
because in Luke's account this is the only time we find verse number 39 in the other accounts we find no man making new wine put it into old bottles we find the rent in the garment right because you tried to put old and new together but Luke's the only one that we find no man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new well why does he not desire the new if he's been drinking the old one because he says the old is better okay now a lot of bible correctors would like to tell you that your king james version is wrong because that word better shouldn't be better it should just be good right no man desires new wine when he's had old wine because the old wine is good that's not what jesus said jesus said they believe that the old wine is better if they're both good you don't have a problem doing something good i mean let's be honest we all got our favorite restaurants okay but if your favorite seafood restaurant is Captain D's and I offer to take you to Red Lobster, I promise you they're both good. But you're not getting the argument that Captain D's is better than Red Lobster. I don't care if it's right across the street. Don't care if there's not a line. Food's better. Okay? You're not going to win that argument. But if both of them's good, you know what else is right there next to Captain D's? Wendy's. I like both of them. Okay? If you pick one, I don't care. They're both good can't really say that one's better than the other one's better for hamburgers the other one's better for fish right but they're both good if you got two things that are good you don't really care which one you get you're just happy with good he says the distinction is made no man desireth new if he's been drinking the old because he thinks the old is better that makes sense right we've made this analogy before it is still true there are only two or three acceptable flavors of Pop-Tarts, and the rest of them are for a whole bunch of sugar, hyped-up kids to try and get them to eat more Pop-Tarts. Brown sugar, cinnamon, strawberry, and then blueberry. That's it. Okay? That's it. Those are better. Okay, Pop-Tarts, those are better. Now, Brother Jordan, if there was another Pop-Tart, are you saying you wouldn't eat it? Now, I'd probably still eat it, but those are better. And I have an opinion on it. Right? When you think that something's better, you're willing to voice your opinion. I don't want that. This is, this is better. It's not just good. This is what I want to invest in. This is what I want to spend my money on. This is what I want to live my life around because I think that this is superior to that. Good doesn't make sense, but better makes sense. Okay, well, the thing that I think about when it comes to this verse we go over to John chapter number 2 we find the marriage supper at Canaan the master of the household Jesus turned the water into wine he said why would you save the best stuff for last because what Jesus made he made the freshest of the new wine right as if it had just been squeezed out of the grape itself because he does all things well and the custom was that you would serve the best first so that everybody could, you know, with their meal, drink the grape juice. Everybody could partake of the best. Okay, It was a sign of disrespect to your guests, especially at an event like a wedding where you knew you was planning to have them, that you wouldn't put your best out first. Because then it looked like you was just giving them the leftovers and you wanted to keep the best for yourself. You didn't want to tap into the good stuff. Right? Well, I'll give you Kroger roast beef, but you can't have this stuff that I went down to the butcher and got for me. Right? You can have a Lunchable, but I'm not making you a sandwich. Okay, It's got the same ingredients. You should just be happy with it. Okay, you don't need... I'm not giving you Domino's. I'm going to give you the pizza Lunchables. Okay? Although back... Hey, when I was in about the third grade, if you had pizza Lunchables, right, you was king of the cafeteria. Everybody wanted to trade with you, okay? But what do you, the analogy, in fact, what the bridegroom says at the marriage of Cain, why did you save the best for last? There was something distinct about new wine. Yeah, it was a little bit more acidic, but it had flavor. The Apostle Paul said that, you know, it's good to take a little bit of wine for an upset stomach. Right? There are health properties to new, fresh, off-the-vine grape juice. 
All right, nowadays they call them antioxidants. Okay, I still don't know much about antioxidants. I must be pro-oxidant. But they say if you got heart problems, grape juice can help level out some of the levels in your blood of certain things. Right? There is not only just the better, but new grape juice tastes better. Tastes fresher. It's got more flavor to it. And they, all day long, they had, or marriage feasts back then could last days. Right? You invite people over and you just keep feeding them until everybody gets so fed that they just leave. So for days, maybe at this point, they just keep pouring out, well, hey, this is, this is the best, and we ran out of the best. Well, this one still tastes pretty good. This one, if you hold your nose and don't look at what you're drinking, you can get past it. Right, and they would get all the way up to where it started to ferment because once it started to ferment, they'd throw it out. It had gone bad. So it doesn't make sense to me, Brother Ron, especially with Jesus making water and wine. And I promise you it tasted like the best grape juice in the world because as far as I know, it's the only grape juice that Jesus ever made by his word and his commandments. Okay, He made all the grapes, but that he made the grape juice. Okay, It tasted better than anything. But we do know that new wine tastes better than week old wine. Tastes better than month old wine. Certainly tastes better than all that stuff that they drink to, you know, get drunk off of. But we know that it's better, so why would somebody, according to Jesus, say that no man having drunk old wine desireth the new? If you've got something that is better, not just for your health, not just for your taste buds. Not just because it's more enjoyable. Right? All around, undisputed, it's better. Everybody at the marriage supper, they understood this is the best. Why didn't we start off with this? We don't want the stuff we was just drinking. We want that stuff. So why would this group say, no, the old is better? Why is that? So the Lord's help this morning we're going to teach on. Right. when you're stuck on the old stuff why was this group that Jesus was talking to that day why did he use this parable and why did he give in Luke's account the only time you're going to find this that a group of them he says if you go back to drinking the old stuff you're not going to want the new stuff no man having drunk already okay that's the first thing to know he's saying Somebody that's already drank the old wine. That means they've been filled. If you're full, you don't have room for nothing else. If you was full on old wine, you're going to stick with that. You're already in too deep. You've been filled with it. It's, you don't have room for anything else. Now here, Jesus, first thing he's talking about is positioning. Okay, now, in context, what he's talking about here is he's talking about religion. Okay, the old wine being the Old Testament, the law that kept us in bondage. He's saying the old wine, you can't be drinking that every day and desire Christ. Because the law was meant to show you that Christ was coming one day and that you needed a Savior. But in order to accept Christ, you have to admit that Christ is the one that fulfilled the law. You can't do it. You've got to put the old grape juice away. Now, are you saying that the Old Testament was bad, Brother Joe? No. It had a time and a place. That was the dispensation of the law. The Apostle Paul tells us that the law was given to us as our schoolmaster. We was just at the Canaan wedding feast. We was drinking the best that we could get our hands on. But when the good stuff came around, everybody then rejected the old stuff. They said, no, that's, that's the best. Right? The law pointed to Christ, and now he's come. We're done with the old stuff. But here he had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. All they were focused on was the old one. He's talking about preference. What did the Pharisees like? They liked the law because they could keep people under their thumb with the law. They could make themselves appear holy under the law. Well, what was the new wine? If the Son sets you free, you free indeed. The new law, right, the perfect law of liberty, was that He fulfilled the law so we don't have to. 
We're robed in his righteousness. I didn't have to earn a thing. All I had to do was have enough common sense to use that measure of faith that he gave me and believe on him after he did all the work and gave all the proof that he was who he said he was. The only thing that I was involved in in my salvation was deciding to get saved. He took care of the rest. That, that's a lot better than waking up every day and having to go slay a calf or a goat or a sheep. Take it all the way up to the top of a mountain where you built an altar. Stay there until it's consumed by the fire. All of that was pointing to that one day the Lamb of God would come. But, when it comes to preference, now practically, in your spirituality, old wine, you know what that is? That's the old man. That's the old ways. If you're full of the world, you don't want none of Jesus. Man cannot have two masters that love one and hate the other. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You can't be full of the world and have the right kind of love for Jesus. You can love him, but you don't love him as he deserves to be loved. Well, that old wine, that's convenience. It was convenient to just stick with what you already knew if you was a Pharisee. It's very inconvenient for Nicodemus in John chapter number 3 to come to him by night and say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And in John 3, 3, he tells him, ye must be born again. And that wasn't convenient. He's a little confused with that. How can a man that is old enter into his mother's womb? He says, nope, you've been born of the flesh. You need to be born of the spirit. And in the rest of that chapter, it's Nicodemus rejecting everything that he has brought up in. Everything that every day he woke up and lived by what he had been taught to a T. Or else they'd have gone out and stoned him. And he rejected it all. To come down there and say, what's this new wine? It's no mystery. Jesus said, taste and see that the Lord is good. But if you're convinced that what you got is the best... You're not going to try something new. There's a lot of Christians that took a drink just enough for them to get salvation. There's, no, there's some got enough of a drink to get baptized, become a member of a church. Some only got enough of a drink that they make it on Christmas and Easter every year. But others got enough to where they'll come on Sundays, but only one of the services. Some got enough that they don't need to come to Sunday school no more. What are you saying? You, you saying that you know everything, Brother Joe? No. But by His grace, I know more today than I did yesterday. Same way you ought to. If your old wine is as I've studied enough, you're not going to study no more. If what you got yes, yesterday satisfied you to the point that you think you don't need any more from God, you're not going to want the new stuff. And see, here's the thing. All that stuff out in the world, we can say, hey, if by God's grace you was raised in a Christian home, you had parents that raised you in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and you weren't exposed to the things of the world, that doesn't mean that what's out in the world is new wine to you. You know what's out in the world? Sin. You know what we was born into? Sin. You know what we was conceived into? Sin. You know what we were before we got saved? Sinners. It may be a different label on the bottle, but sin is sin. And the old man knows how to sin. He's pretty good at it, too. Because that part of me, that's still going back to the dust of this earth. It didn't get saved when I got saved. i got to wrestle with that every day. Well, if you were content with, well, I've lived enough as an example for Christ in my testimony, you're not going to want the new one. You're going back to the old stuff that's in the old bottles. But first thing, is, if you prefer what you've got, you can't sell somebody something they don't think that they need. They may not need it, but if you can make them think that they need it, then you can sell it to them. Okay? Now, our pastor used to be a salesman. Okay? I honestly believe that he could sell a freezer to an Eskimo. Okay? Guy may not need it, but by the time he got done with him, he'd have thought he needed it. 
Or if he came in and said, oh, I'm thinking about this, he's going to tell them all the best details about it, and the guy's going to say, well, you know, that sounds pretty good. That's better than what I got. He said, did he con people? No, he just knew how to, if you needed it, he knew which one you was going to get. Well, Jesus said it this way, the whole have no need of a physician. If you don't think you're sick, you're not going to the doctor. If you don't think that you're halt or lame, you're not going and seeking the great physician to make you whole. We are a needy people. Not because we're always walking around with our hand out, but because I'm not enough to satisfy me. I'm not enough to satisfy you. You're not enough to satisfy you. We are needy people because it's by the grace of God, the mercies of God, the love of God, and through the blood that's been applied to our life that we can receive what it is that we need from God. New one, his mercies are renewed every day. You know why? Because we need new wine every day. God loves you and cares about you so much that he doesn't give you the leftover blessings from yesterday. No, he renews it and makes it again just specially for you. Whether you're in a position to receive it or not. Because he's long-suffering and he's no respecter of persons. So if he's still blessing this person, he wants to bless me the same way. If I'm not in the position to receive it, that's not God's fault, that's my fault. But even if I'm not in the right position, I believe that every day God has everything that you need waiting on you in heaven. Whether you're standing there and saying, Lord, I've crafted a new bottle today just for today's new wine. Because I don't want this new wine to burst the bottle from yesterday. I want it to be preserved. It's a new wine in new bottles, verse number 38. It says both are preserved. We've already said that new wine went into a wine skin made of leather. That leather had to be tanned, had to be worked, fashioned, cut. A lot of times they did engraving on the side of them. The last step was usually that they would sew it with a certain sewing pattern that made it watertight, or in this case, grape juice tight. A lot of effort had to go in to turn that leather into a bottle if we go through the effort of preparing those new bottles I preached on this one time I think Brother Randy on crafting new bottles might have been there in a tag team or something but what that is is that's you reigning in your flesh what's leather? it's skin it's flesh what's our bottles? we have to constrain the old man to be in the position to receive the blessings of the new man See, if we just casually walk in with a bottle that we used to have, we haven't maintained that flesh, that bottle's gotten dried out, it's returned back to its dead state, what happens if God puts the blessings in it? It's going to eat right through it. The flesh cannot receive the things of God. Right? Just like the Word is spiritually discerned. It's not intellectually discerned. Your brain can't comprehend what's on the page unless God touches you and gives you the understanding. You can sit down and read until you're blue in the face, but unless by faith you're reading with the ex expectation and the belief that God will, because He said He would, interpret the living Word under your heart, you're not going to get much out of it. You know what you're going to get? Things that you remember learning before things you remember hearing preached before not going to get that new wine that fresh taste of what you need today in order to receive those, what we got to do we got to rein in that old man Apostle Paul said that he died daily you know what that means he was crafting new bottles every morning even those things that God gave him yesterday what's he doing he's going back and making sure that that calf skin or that wine skin hadn't dried out over the night He's making sure that the cork hadn't come out of the plug. He's making sure that nothing that 
It isn't supposed to be inside of there. Hadn't got in there. He's inspecting. He's taking notes. See, at first we were talking about preference. Now we're talking about preparation. We already said a lot of effort went into getting that grape juice. In fact, outside of oil, which they used to do a lot of cooking, it's what they used to, you know, at the time in the temple. That's what they put into the what we call nowadays a menorah. Right? It was used in spiritual application. You would use that oil to anoint. Right? You would offer offerings up unto the Lord that involved oil. Right? Oil was a very important commodity. Grape juice probably up there is about number two or three. If we take away like wheat or cornmeal, something like that. Grape juice, not everybody had access to clean drinking water. But you knew if you got new wine, it's clean. Why? Because it didn't come from the ground. It didn't come from the sky. It came from the vine. And if it came from the vine, that means that the vine had to be alive. A grapevine dies real quick. That's why Jesus, in the analogy of the vineyard, right in the husbandman, he said that he would take those that weren't of the vine, he'd cast them into the fire. Why? Because it hurt the vine. That's why when he said that he grafted us Gentiles into the vine, that means that we became a part of the vine. That which was dead was made alive because it's hooked up to the vine. Well, see, just because you're a part doesn't mean that you get to partake. That involves preparation. First, you've got to get over the fact that the old man desires the things of the world. It's going to be like that until Jesus comes back or until we go through the grave. But you got to get over the fact that the rest of the world is talking about how good the old stuff is. doesn't bother me. You can do what you want to do. But my preference is always going to be for the thing that I know which is best. They say that the old is better. I say that the new is best. See, there was preference. Then there was preparation. But then some people are just particular. There are some people okay, that believe okay, go ahead. let's take a step back. The Bible teaches us talk about biblical separation. The Bible talks about doctrine, which means if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Doctrine is non negotiable, but then the Bible talks about personal standards. Okay? And you can go study the conversations that the Apostle Paul and Peter had. You can go study how God had to do a little bit of preaching to Peter about a golden fleece coming down out of heaven. Okay, you can go study about Paul's missionary journeys. But what it comes down to is if God's put it on your heart, that's fine. God bless you. If God's giving you that conviction, live by it because you're going to be blessed by it. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that my personal conviction is what you have to live by. Some people thought that the old wine was better because they didn't have to have any responsibility. Now this isn't the Pharisees. This would be the people in the audience. The Pharisees weren't the only one there that day when Jesus was crucified and delivered over to Pilate. The whole multitude chanted, crucify him, crucify him. They cried for Barabbas, the murderer, to be set free. Did they prefer Barabbas? Probably. But see, they were real particular about what they expected out of themselves. They expected the Pharisees to tell them what to do. They expected the Pharisees to tell them how to do it. They expected the Pharisees to rebuke them if they did something wrong. But there's just one problem with that. In the Bible, according to God, in the New Testament, spirituality is not a top-down business. There are no CEOs. There are no managers or supervisors when it comes to your spirituality. There is you and there is God. The Pharisees were teaching a whole lot of stuff that Jesus says 
they were teaching the doctrine of men as the doctrine of God that they had become blasphemers saying that God has said when God has not said right, Brother Mike's wearing a nice white shirt today Okay, I know of certain people I know of certain churches that say unless I have a shirt on as white as Brother Mike's I can't get up behind the pulpit show me chapter and verse on that also I only made them half mad today the shirt's like half red and half white that's why it's pink so we're at least half right today brother Ron there's some people that back in the day I've heard it preached on recording that if you had wire rimmed glasses you didn't have completely rimmed glasses that you weren't right with God show me chapter and verse on that don't even show me I'd have been okay brother Ron if they'd have just showed me a verse where you can reasonably get that conclusion out of it for their personal conviction not even getting to the fact that they're teaching it like doctrine but well those we would call them legalists okay that group of individuals they still get crowds I used to wonder about that brother Ron how in the, why in the world would you go listen to somebody talk about how wicked you've been all week when really all they're doing is telling you what they expect you know them to live in, and then a lot of times they're hypocrites they don't even do what they're preaching why in the world would you go through that and eventually it dawned on it's because they've got less responsibility in their minds as long as they do what the preacher says they're okay with God but as a good rule of thumb if he's preaching the Bible do what he says okay God gave them to the church why to watch for your soul but on top of that if you just do what the preacher says you're missing out on a whole lot you see the preacher didn't save you the preacher didn't die for you the preacher didn't give his only begotten son for you because at one point that had been me because once he came along neither one of us was the only begotten okay I didn't die for you okay preacher didn't give up me to have you you know what the preacher did preacher got saved just like you did and he was counted faithful by the Lord and put into a position but that doesn't mean that the preacher knows exactly how you need to live for the Lord oh he's got doctrine he's got examples if you want to be counseled by him he'll take the Bible all day long and tell you what the Bible says but you know whose responsibility it is for you to know what God wants you to do it's yours that's the doctrine called soul liberty you are responsible for living and getting your own personal convictions you're responsible for taking the great commission and doing with it what God tells you to do you're responsible for offering up prayers not good enough to put it on the prayer list so other people at the church will be praying no the Bible says that you're commanded the Apostle Paul said that he wished men everywhere would lift up holy hands offering up prayer supplication intercession and thanksgiving that's four different types of prayer and unless you've mastered all of them don't have an excuse to take the day off because he Apostle Paul also inspired to write pray without ceasing if you get tired of one change to another God gave you four but that's a personal conviction that you have to have I can't teach on praying hard enough that it becomes important to you I can't give you a quota on how much you got to pray every week can't give you a quota on how much you need to read every week you know how much you need to read how much God wants you to read you know how much you need to pray how much God wants you to pray but so many like the crowd a lot of the time that Jesus was preaching to granted a lot of times the Pharisees would stir him up and they'd want to stone him just as much as the Pharisees did and then the Bible says that Jesus disappeared in the midst they just walked right past him and they didn't even see him why were they so upset because he's saying you're responsible you don't get to shuck this off on somebody else you don't get to just walk in and then pay a fee in order to have everything taken care of by somebody else 
The Catholics called that. They tried that. They called it. I think it was no. I'll think of it eventually. But they used to tell the rich people, "You can live however you want to. All you got to do is pay a certain price, and we'll give you a piece of paper that says your sins are forgiven." Yes, indulgences. That's what it is. It's one of the things that Martin Luther was angriest about. But why? Because that's convenient. And they wanted the money. So if you want to give me the money, I'll tell you whatever you want to hear. Right? That hadn't changed. Bob talks about beware of gainsayers. But when it comes to personal responsibility, old wine says that's somebody else's problem. Old wine says, well, God will give that burden to somebody else. The old wine says, well, I'm where God's supposed, you know, wants me to be, where God wants me to be, where I'm supposed to be. But new wine says, well, I'm where I'm supposed to be, but am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? You can drive all the way to vacation, but unless you go on vacation once you're there, all you're doing is sitting in a car waiting for vacation to end. You can labor all day long. But unless you go out and reap, unless you go out into the field and gather what it is you've been working on, crows are going to eat it. It's going to fall by the wayside. It's going to turn into compost real quick. It'll be trodden under the feet of men. So you think these people in this day thought that what they were drinking that it was better and they refused to taste what was best they couldn't entertain the idea that God himself in the flesh was telling them that he wanted to deal with them personally but they wanted to deal with God corporately what did the people of Israel say Moses you go up the mountain we preached on that last week don't let God talk to us lest we die he too big. He too scary. I don't want to deal with God. You deal with God, and then you come down and tell us what we need to do. All throughout Israel's history, you know who was supposed to be king over Israel? God, according to the Old Testament. But yet they desired a king because other people had kings. You know why they wanted a king? Because they wanted somebody to tell them what to do. They didn't want to be personally responsible. They didn't want to have to think about things like national security, they didn't want to think about relations with other countries. They didn't want to think about all those stuff that you think's boring in Washington, D.C., but because the church house hadn't thought about it in a long time, America's in a mess. Those things that aren't fun to talk about, sit down and figure out about what's the right thing to do, they didn't want to deal with it. They said, God, give us a king. So God did. And a lot of kings didn't have their heart for the Lord. Israel ended up in a whole lot worse shape started off good and then it got bad then it got good then it got better and then after Solomon it went downhill there were times when the king would do that which was right in the eyes of the Lord but it's few and far in between you see when you hitch your wagon to another horse you gotta go where that horse goes they hitched their wagon to the king and they had to go where the king went God told you to take his yoke upon him you know what that means you're not hitching your wagon to the king. You're walking side by side with the king. He said his yoke was easy and his burden was light. You know what that means? He said, just walk with me and I'll take most of the load. It's too heavy for you, but I want you to come with me. I didn't buy you to leave you where you were. Come with me and we'll get to where I want you to be. Nowhere in your Bible does it say that the pastor gets to yoke up with the Lord and you get to ride in the back. That's convenient, but it's not biblical. Old wine says, well, the, the people down at the church house, they're, they're responsible for how we're supposed to live. Nope, that's you. We've done run out of time. But the whole point is, if you don't want to drink the new wine, the old is better in your eyes. If you're satisfied with what you've got, new's not important. But if you desire something better, 
news is the only thing that's going to satisfy. 